Hello everybody and welcome to the Creator Space Online. Today we're going to be looking at data protection, archiving and rights protection, rights protection. So this is digital arts rights in a digital world. So once again, data protection, archiving and rights protection, digital arts rights in a digital world. So thanks for joining us. This is a, you know, a really important session. We've had a lot of questions about this and I want to make sure that you know, we can address some of these topics. And uh, you know, this is a, a really an intro to these concepts and we're hoping to uh, then bring some more uh, intensives on uh, you know these kinds of business uh, and legal aspects for uh, digital arts and uh, you know it's a really timely and important topic because we hear regularly on the news you know uh, data protection breaches or data uh, breaches uh, password breaches things like this so you know we, you've probably heard this from other uh, programming and other uh, um, you know aspects of the different workshops uh, through our library partners but it's a, a really key uh, component in terms of uh, you know protecting your uh, your data and protecting your digital art as you as you make it so a, a really important thing because as we know it can take a lot of hours to create this work and you know protecting it archiving it and ensuring that it uh, you know you have access to it and uh, and storing it and then also that you have the final rights to it so that you've you know dealt with a lot of things so we're going to talk about a whole uh, you know a, a blend of all these different aspects um, so I just want to start by uh, thanking all our partners in this project. So we have the Canada Council for the Arts, then we have our library partners. So we have the Blue Mountains Public Library, we have the Collingwood Public Library, and we have the Wasaga Beach Public Library. So at these library partners, this is where you can access our digital arts computers. We're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. But the digital arts computers are fully loaded iMac computers that have all the digital arts programs that we've been talking about through this Creator Space project. So we have you know, video editing through Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve. We have the Affinity Creative Suite. So that includes Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and Affinity Publisher. Those are very similar to the Adobe products. So, you know, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and Adobe InDesign. So we have those those work, uh, those work uh, those software elements. Then we also have Blender for 3D animation. We have Final Draft for screenwriting. We have uh, uh, Fusion for, uh, you know, animation, uh, effects work. It's kind of like an After Effects program. So a lot of a, a blend of all those kind of software that's uh, really great. We also have something called DCP-O-Matic for film distribution. So you can access all these elements through our website. It's uh, www.tbmcs.ca. So tbmcs.ca. So the, the Blue Mountains Creator Space ca or tbmcreatorspace.com so everything will lead you there so uh you know really important to, to to look at and we're going to talk about how these computers are actually set up for data protection and privacy uh, as well so that's a, a really cool thing so let's get right into what we're going to talk about today so we're going to look at data protection and privacy then we're going to look at privacy and action how the creator space digital arts computers are set up to ensure that there is that protection available then we're going to look at password protection for digital assets uh, and then we're going to look at saving digital assets and the archive process. Finally, uh, we move on to the cloud storage and local storage, archival storage types. And to round it all off, we're going to look at rights protection for digital artists, which will include copyright registration, contracts and chain of title and ownership of your finished work. We'll have some, uh, uh, you know, some Q&A time and I'll also put up my email so you can send me an email if you have any specific questions. Really want to make sure that we can answer all of these things. It's, we've been getting a lot of questions about these topics. So I want to be able to go over them. You know, you can rewatch this once we're done. And, you know, if you, if any more questions come up, you can always uh, consider, you know, sending me an email and then we can talk more about um, uh, some of these aspects again. So really, really uh, uh, a lot of stuff to cover. So let's get right into it. So data protection and privacy. So now in a digital world, essentially what's happening is your digital footprint, and that includes your name, login information, passwords, all of this is essentially your life online. And protecting your digital footprint and digital profiles are just as important as protecting your wallet or driver's license. So, you know, we're always looking at, okay, we have, you know, do I have my wallet? Uh, you don't want to leave it somewhere or like your passport, you know, things like this, you, you're protecting it. And that's just as important as protecting, let's say your login. So you go to a computer, you're using Gmail, you log in, and then you leave the computer. Now you're exposed, it will log out usually after a certain amount of time, but your, your information is out there and it's, it's available. You can, uh, some computers might have auto, you know, uh, save passwords or autofill, things like this. So all of that's out there. This is fine if it's your own device and usually your own device has a password. So you have these multiple layers of password protection. But where it becomes more important is on computer 
computers that you're using in the public sphere. So these are like computers that are library partners. So what we've done is knowing these, these aspects and after prototyping and workshopping and figuring out how to, how to best protect everyone's uh, privacy, we've come up with a great solution. We're going to talk about what that is. But in the meantime, you can also, best practices you can get into such as logging out. When you finish doing email, log out. You don't have to stay logged in, log out. Log out of anything that you've logged into. Usually there's a quick button, you know, log out. And you'll notice that sometimes if you're on a, on a website, you log in, you're using something, even if you close it and you open it back up again, you might still be logged in because it just remembers a lot of stuff. All of these browsers are designed to, you know, collect this data and they're really personal, if you think about it, personal computers. So when we take personal computers and we make them public computers, they're not necessarily designed for that. So that's something to always keep in mind. If you're in an office environment and you're using the computer, uh, let's say you're using a computer, it might be a work computer, or you have a work computer at home, and you're also doing some of your digital arts, digital arts work on that, also consider that as you know, making sure you're logging out and, and uh, so that it's not uh, back in there. So let's say it's a shared computer that you take from the office. So that's something to consider as well. Make sure you're logging out of anything. Now, the other thing too is, uh, you know, we get into some privacy policies and best practices that we're going to, you know, talk about such as that logging out. And we're going to look at what we came up with for the Creator Space public computers. Data can also consist of your actual digital arts data. So that could be your actual images, your photos, video files, editing projects, sound recordings, animation, and all the projects and assets that go along with that, voiceovers. And also I should say things like scripts. So if you're using Final Draft, you're doing screenplays, you're writing a book, you're writing a podcast, anything like that, that's all your digital data, right? And all of those assets need to be protected as well. So, you know, and this is the main thing. So especially when you're using a public computer, you can expose your data to unwanted use or even just exploration. Someone could be like, oh, let's just see what this person's doing. So that's fine if you're working with the person and you know you want them to look at stuff hey can you check out my script can you can you check out this uh, video edit that i've done and you want them to do it it's only when i i want to stress the unwanted when people are just going through your stuff so we don't usually like that it's just kind of like you know your your uh, underwear drawer you don't want anyone going through it so that's the same idea you want to protect it you don't want people just going through things so consider it in that same way you don't want to have your Again, like your wallet, someone going through your wallet. This is the same idea. And oftentimes it's even called that, your digital wallet. So let's think of it that way, that you want that wallet, that it's on you, you're in control of it. And once you get into these best practices, such as logging out or knowing, you know, asking questions, you know, if you're using a public computer, does it log out automatically? Does it, does it uh, take all the data off? What's the process in that? And, and as we've learned through this project and talking with our library partners, this has been the design is that we can actually create a lot of this uh, data and we have also the library uh, staff, they're busy looking at uh, protecting you as well and going over this kind of data management and, uh, and making sure you're logged out. So everyone's watching out uh, in, in these kinds of community atmospheres and, and places such as the library, but it becomes even, it becomes more of a thing if you're going to, you know, some sort of a public uh, like cafes or somewhere where there's a, a shared computer. We're seeing less of that, but just something to think about. And this is also, uh, can be something if you're using public Wi-Fi, you know, you can, you want to still log out because sometimes it could be some sort of login and, uh, you know, bringing your computer to a coffee shop. It's there, it's open, you know, so just logging out is a very good best practice method for all your computers and for all your types of online passwords. So log, remember to just log out. And I think that's really the main, the main lesson here is logging out. So privacy in action. So this is what we came up with with the Creator Space Digital Arts Computers. So in order to protect your privacy and data, what we've done is Creator Space Digital Arts Computers in the Collingwood Public Library and the Blue Mountains Public Library, we're using a new software called Deep Freeze. And what Deep Freeze does is it actually creates a final version of the computer as it stands. And every time you log in, it logs into that start point. So what it does then after you log out, erases all new data entered or added to a computer's operating system, hard drive, documents, or desktop. So every time you log out, if you've installed a piece of software, it's gonna remove it. If you've added images onto the desktop, like photos, and you've been working on it in Affinity Photo, it deletes everything. If you've logged into browsers such as Safari or Chrome, it logs you out. Everything is logged out. It removes it, it removes any kind of autofills, passwords, anything that you may have accidentally left, it's gonna remove it. 
So again, if you're using best practices and you're logging out already, it's not a concern because you've already logged out and it's, and it's gonna do that. But it makes sure that if you've put some photos on the desktop, you're working on it, you're done, it's gonna remove all of that. So how do we deal with that? So now you can safely browse the internet on these computers. It's gonna remove you know, anything. You can work on your projects, but this is what you need to do. All users must now use, you gotta to remember to use the external hard drive. So the external hard drives are on there. You can put a folder. You can have it you know, with your name and people respect the folders and not going through them. Now, the next layer is, you know, we have this community, I, I really believe with digital creators, digital artists, that we have a mutual respect for one another. And so putting it into a folder, the next thing you can do is you can technically, you can put, you know, make a, a password protected folder. Um, but the, the best thing that we'd like to recommend is using your own personal external hard drive. So that's where you can then do the final, like you take all the data, so your photos, your images, your video editing, then put it onto your own external hard drive. And then you can bring that back and forth. That way you can use the external hard drives at the library computers, put your put data on there, video if you need the faster solid state drive. But if you have your own, you can then put it back on there. You can go back and forth. And all this data through the software gets relinked and it gets resorted and found. So you're never losing anything, you can always open things. And that's the best practice is storing everything on your own local, uh, uh, sorry, on your own external personal hard drive. And that could be, you know, small drives. It can be hard drives like this. It could be little thumb drives, any kinds. There's all sorts of shapes and sizes. There's bigger ones, right? There's smaller ones, any kind of uh, external hard drives. Use those and then, you know, store everything on there. You can work off of those, but put them onto the digital arts computers if you want the extra speed of the external hard drives or just the convenience. If you're gonna be on there for a while, you know, you can, uh, you know, most likely the data will be on there, but we don't guarantee that your video footage will stay on that external hard drive for many weeks uh, or days. It could be erased, someone can come in and erase it, or there's just not enough space and we have to erase it. So we don't guarantee the data storage. So you need to put things onto an external hard drive as you go. So if you're gonna have a larger, perhaps video editing project, make sure to have it on your own external hard drive. You can just plug that hard drive in and work directly off of that. That's the convenience. Now, where do editing projects get stored? So what we've done is we set it up that all the data for the, the uh, let's say Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve projects, that they're stored on, a, on the actual uh, external hard drive of these digital arts computers. All the other projects, it's up to you where you save it. There's no direct links, but if you do save it on the desktop, it will get erased. So always make sure to save any kind of file from any kind of software onto either the digital arts computers external hard drives or your own external hard drives. So that's really, really important. I wanna stress that. Okay, so password protection with digital assets. So you can also password, you know, add password protection with digital files. And that can be sometimes, some of the software offers that. You can also do that with things like uh, folders. You can do password protected folders on computers. Then we can also do, if we have digital folders on Google Drive or Cloud Drives, right, you can add password protection there. So, you know, make sure you can always do that, that they're, you know, you, you set the restrictions, you set who has access to it, you can add people to have access to it, and you can take access away. So that's a really important thing. And Google's been stressing that. I always get that. I use Google Drive. I always, always get these messages. Hey, you have, you know, 10% of your folders and files are exposed to some public access. And then I go through it and I go, okay, well, this person, this project is done. They no longer need access. So it's always important to go through your materials. Don't just leave it out there. Uh, I've seen that before. I've left, you know, open access to something that was a couple years old. And all of a sudden I'm seeing some footage from this file appear in some sort of another project that I didn't know about. And that's because I left it open to that uh, overall organization's access. So it's important to control that. So give the access, restrict the access, and make sure you're, that way you're protecting things. If people need some sort of files, they can contact you and say, hey, I don't have access to this folder anymore. And then you can have the discussion, okay, well, what are you doing with the materials? Why do you need access? And they can tell you why they wanna use it. And then at least you, as the artist, you have control over your digital assets and your your files and that's really important to and that we get into that rights protection area as well another thing that's really great to use is something like iCloud so your Apple ID gives you iCloud I think I can't remember what, how much it is it's 500 gigabytes but you get a, a set amount that's free then you can also get paid storage through Apple but your Apple ID is a really great and extremely secure tool so if you log into any Apple system 
such as our digital arts computer, you can log in with your Apple ID. So then you, you know, your com the computer becomes your persona of an Apple ID. You can access your iCloud, your photos, everything can get loaded on there. And then what happens is once you log out of the computer, that deep freeze software will actually log you out and erase all of that material and data. So it's a really good way to, to work. Alternatively, again, best practice, you can log out with your Apple ID on any Apple uh, device. So you log in, you log out, and it removes all the data that you've added, like photos, anything like that. So that's really, really important. So always consider that. Your Apple ID is a great tool to use for Apple devices. So that can be on an iPad. So if you're using some of the iPads that are available through our Creator Space project, you take out the iPad Pro from the Blue Mountains Public Library. You can use your Apple ID to get all of your, lo you log in, it becomes like your own iPad while you're using it. Then just make sure you log out. If you, if you keep that Apple ID open, you risk the, uh, you know, the problem that someone else is accessing your Apple ID. So make sure again, everything that you log into on any kind of a public shared computer system that you log in, you log out. And uh, that's really important. So again, if you're, let's say you're someone's borrowing your iPad, you log out of your Apple ID as well, and then they can use their own. And it's very, you know, user friendly that way. And all the data gets removed and then it gets rebuilt again when you log in. And that's the whole beauty of it. Again, on the digital arts computers, these iMacs that we have at the, at the library partners, just you can log into your Apple ID, access your iCloud, and then store everything there as well. So that's a really great tool to use that. So saving digital assets and the archive process. So as you work in digital arts, there's a lot of materials and files, and it's really important to save these and to have an archive process. So the first thing is, what kind of assets are you gonna have to deal with? So these include project files. So each software has a specific project file that you're using. And that could be, you know, uh, DaVinci Resolve, it's a .drp project, there's Affinity Photo, there's a, a Fusion project, a Blender, uh, there's, uh, you know, any of these project files, uh, Final Draft, I believe is .fdx. So the different file, those last extension things, refer to the file, the project file that then opens in the software. That project file will only open in that specific software. So a .drp, like a DaVinci Resolve project, you can't open in Adobe Premiere, or you can't just open it on a desktop on another computer without having that, the, the actual software. So that's a really important thing. Project is very different than actual final renders, and we'll get to what that means. So the next thing that you're gonna have a raw, is your raw data. So that consists of video, um, you know, photos, sound, anything like that all of that raw data. So that means, you know, the video that you shot with the camera, that is all the raw files. So you might have 20 hours of video. The photos, you might have 300 photos. All of that is raw. You might only use one photo, but you, you have 300 photos that you're choosing specifics from. Then you have all your sound files. So let's say you're recording music, you're recording a podcast, all of those specific individual sound files are there as well. So that's important, like having all of that raw data. Now, the next thing is, out of the raw data, the video, photos, and sound, you can also choose what you want to store. So there might be things that you determine you, you, is, you know, they're outtakes or they're not needed. They're mistakes. And you say, hey, I don't need that 10 minutes. I did a shot and it was, uh, you know, too dark. I'm never going to use it. So make the decision and always ask yourself, is there a chance you might use it? Is it, is anything usable in it? If there's, if you say yes, I might use it in the future, then don't destroy it and then delete it. But if you know for sure you're only gonna use these three photos and the rest are like out of focus and you never want, you never gonna need to use them, don't store everything. So figure out what you absolutely need to store in your raw files. The next thing is you have your finished rendered files. So these are things like JPEGs, MOW, WAV files, all of this kind of materials. So that's what you render out of the software. So you open your project, let's say in, in Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve, and you end up rendering out a .mov or a QuickTime MOV, and that's a video that you can now play anywhere. Now that final rendered master will play anywhere. And that's really one of the most important digital assets because you know, you want to always have that project file if you need to go back and make changes. But what's more important is also having the final rendered file. So all three are just as equally important, but at least at a minimum, you want to always make sure you're, you're archiving these final masters because that's going to be important that, you know, 10 years from now, you might be like, I want to watch that documentary that I did about, uh, you know, bees and, and pollination. And you have this final render. If you don't have it anywhere, you won't be able to watch it. 
Now this is more important, the digital assets are what you have in your own possession. And I wanna differentiate this from if you put it on YouTube or you're putting it on Vimeo, places like that. A lot of like, when you put it on YouTube, you technically can't download it again and it's just out there and on there. And as some people say, it's out there forever on YouTube, that's fine, but you need that actual file. So every time you upload it to YouTube, Vimeo, any kind of other service, or if there's like photo servers or anything like that, most of the time, a lot of these, these processes such as YouTube, it gets re-encoded. Vimeo also re-encodes, but if you have a Vimeo, um, I believe most of them offer that, but you can actually download the original file in most cases that you've uploaded. So that's a great kind of archival tool as well, but YouTube re-encodes it into its own codec. And that no longer is the same as your original it usually can be less quality. It makes it smaller, it makes it more compressed because they need to store, I don't know how many billions of minutes of, of video every, every month get uploaded to YouTube. They need to store all of that. So it gets compressed and it's no longer your original file. So don't consider YouTube to be any kind of an archival. It's just a way of distribution. Uh, it's a way of posting things. Same with social media, everything gets compressed. So you post a photo on Instagram, it gets compressed and it's not your original. And you might put filters on it or anything. You don't know what, what, you know, even by accident, you might put something on it a bit, but everything gets compressed. Same with like Facebook, all the social media channels, it's re reconfiguring your original um, files. So that's not good. But where it doesn't get compressed is storing it on your hard drive or on an, on an online uh, storage uh, uh, system, like a cloud system. So cloud storage and local storage, these are really important. Two, two aspects. So cloud storage uses the services via online storage providers. This can be things like iCloud, Google Drive. Um, you know, there's a lot of these companies use Amazon Web Services. So anywhere where there's like a cloud storage provider. Vimeo is kind of an in-between because you can put your video up there. And like I said, you can actually download the original file. So it becomes kind of like an archival storage as well. So these cloud storage servers, they actually have some redundancy. So let's say something failed in the cloud sphere. Uh, your data is, is somewhere else as well. So you'll never lose the video file in, in you know, properly operating cloud storage. Now, if you're using something that's not as one of these kind of major players, I would say, then you also, you can run the risk that maybe the company would no longer exist. So you have to think about it. Okay, if I'm using storage with companies such as Apple or with uh, Google, for Google Drive, those are really uh, long established companies. They have you know billions of dollars of net worth. They're not gonna disappear uh, anytime soon. We would have, we'd have a lot of warning before that kind of cloud storage was going, disappearing or being terminated. So those are massive companies. And if you, sometimes there's some smaller companies and you know a lot of, and there's some transfer tools and some of these things that aren't for really archiving. Um, and you have to just remember, is that good or bad, right? There's things like Dropbox too, um, you know, that can be used and that can be great, but I wouldn't necessarily treat Dropbox as an archival thing. It's more of a storage file, uh, storage for sharing. And that's like WeTransfer, any kind of those things. Those are ways to share things. In Google Drive, it's not necessarily a direct sharing tool, but it is a drive that's cloud-based that you can then share, you can share access, you can share access to the assets, people can download it, people can just watch it, people can edit and collaborate with you in that as well. So there's a few things. Dropbox works the same way, and uh, you know that can be used as well. Um, so just consider what, what you have, and you might already have some storage. So if you have a Gmail account, you have some storage. If you have an Apple ID, you get some iCloud storage already. So you don't have to necessarily pay for these things. They're already free or you get some limited access. So that's always a great tool. So just consider those, uh, those are the cloud storage. Now local storage, uh, that's what, you know, local storage, technically local storage is what's directly on the computer. But I also wanna say, you know, your own storage that you have like in your hand. So this is the use of external hard drives where you can store all the data. And that's, you know, things again, like, you know, like these kinds of hard drives, you store all the data on it and it's local because it's, in your possession. So it's not out there, it's not on a cloud drive, but it's here. So if I wanna share it with people, I wouldn't give the drive, cause this is my, like an archive backup. I would keep it and then I could, you know, put it to a cloud storage or a WeTransfer or something like that to share this, the data, right? And at the same time, what I really wanna always recommend is having it on two hard drives. 
So that really brings us to the next topic, which is archival storage types. So using at least two hard drives to have a backup is vital for archiving your digital data assets. So that means, again, the project files, the raw files, and the final rendered project uh, files. So like your MOVs, your JPEGs, all that kind of stuff. That's really important to have and, and, uh, and uh, back up with. Um, to have the one drive and the second drive as a backup. Because what happens if one drive fails? Then you have no backup. So again, like I said, with the cloud storage, what's great is that it is technically, it has the a failure backup. It's redundant. It's stored in uh, you know uh, multiple uh, locations and the data is uh, on different drives technically. So that network drive solutions, it's out there. If one area fails, it can get rebuilt and it rebuilds and that happens. Drives will just fail, it rebuilds it somewhere else. And your data just seamlessly seems to always be there. We have little hiccups sometimes with cloud storage, but it's very quick in terms of you know, not missing uh, or not uh, disappearing. So, but your own external hard drive, that's the problem because that's where if it fails, it's gone. So if you have it on two, the chances of it failing, I believe, are in the billions where both drives fail on you. And especially if, let's say, one's a solid state drive, you can, I would still back up on another drive. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a solid state drive because they can be a bit more expensive. We're talking about $100 or more per terabyte, uh, $150 or so for a terabyte, and versus the $75 for two terabytes of a non-solid state drive, right? So you're getting way more but a quarter of the price. So, um, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, make it work and how do you make it uh, an affordable archival process? So, you know, I recommend getting at least one solid state drive. And the reason why the solid state drive is it has no spinning parts. So this is a solid state drive and it's just basically like an SD card for a camera. There's nothing that spins in it. So it has less failure in terms of the spinning thing. Sometimes when you have other hard drives, the external hard drives, you'll hear some clicking and then it starts to not be able to spin or read the data. And that's because there's a physical surface and it can also not work eventually. Another tool that can be used on a more professional side is something called LTO. And LTO are, uh, you know, they're uh, a professional archive uh, type system. And they're, they're really interesting because they can be used, uh, you know, they, they basically become a big tape that you can store everything on. So imagine just like a big tape system that is, uh, you know, going, uh, uh, from, you know, from kind of deck to deck. And uh, it's almost like kind of like a reel. And I'm going to just see if we can pull something up quickly, LTO storage, and I can show you guys a, um, a, f a quick photo of what that, what that can look like. Okay, so here's kind of something that's interesting. So this is, this is like an LTO 8 tape, and you can see it's like a big tape. It goes into a, a system, and then that allows you to write data onto it. And the, the beautiful thing about this is that um, it has a very long shelf life, and I believe, you know, 25 plus years, uh, and you can keep rewriting on it and stuff. So this is where sometimes a lot of uh, films will use this kind of uh, tape storage to really have some additional ability to, um, to you know, to work with, uh, you know, making sure that the data is stored on devices that have a very uh, robust life. So tape, traditionally, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, videotape, cassette tapes, and that's been a great backup system. They tend to last quite a while. I have tapes that are, you know, over 20 years old. I can still access them and view them. So the LTO, same idea versus some hard drives. You know, I've recently had some archive uh, hard drives I started up and they don't work, but then I have a backup. So that one will work. And immediately, if one of your hard drives fails, you need to go back to two, right? So if one's failed, you have the one, make a copy of that one that still works right away onto a new hard drive. So you always wanna keep the two. And then, you know, I've seen it fail and it's such a great feeling when you know, okay, that hard drive failed, no problem, I have another backup. It's worse if it fails and you're trying to recover it. And data recovery can be very expensive, time consuming, and it doesn't really, necessarily lead to a great um, 
uh, experience when you're stressed and you might still lose some things, even data recovery. Maybe you recover 70% of the hard drive and a bunch of things are lost. So that's always a, a, a possibility. So this archival thing is really, really important. So, you know, if you really have something, if you spend a, a bit of a budget on a film, for example, you might want to consider doing things like an LTO or you might want to consider using things like the solid state drives, even having two solid state drives. They're going to definitely last longer and are less prone to any kind of failure. So that's always a great uh, tool. Okay, so rights protection and digital assets. This is where we're going to move to next. And so rights protection is really talking about, you know, do you have the rights to that artwork that you worked on, the digital art that you're doing? So that for example, involves digital arts often involves other people. So let's look at some of the examples. So if you're, let's say, doing music and you're collaborating, have other musicians in the song, and it's maybe you're not a band, but let's say you're an, an artist and you hire some musicians, then you have to think about what are the rights to that piece of music and have you, if you've paid the musicians for playing on it, you should have contracts in place. And this is really important. So the, re the point of the contract is to show and decide who is the final owner or author of digital art that you made. So in this case, a song, a piece of music. So if you wrote the, the music, then you're the writer. So that's one aspect of it. But then it comes down to the production, the actual master who's in the music. And those are kind of the two main rights of music. So you have the, the writer part, then you have the master part which is you know who's in the song who plays in the song who's featured in the song and that's why we'll hear sometimes you know you think people do covers so the the writer of the music still gets compensation usually equally to what the final new master is and then the covering band gets the other part of it uh, so it's like a 50 50 in that way so that's really important to remember but you want to as an artist make sure that all the musicians that maybe you've hired just to play for that album or for that specific song that you have contracts in place they're compensated and the contract outlines that the final ownership of the music is with you for example so that's where we get into that rights protection the next big example is things like a film or a documentary or a film with actors or people participating in the documentary you want to have things a contract essentially that's called a release form or an actor contract that releases their rights to it as well. So if they act in your film, you want to have a contract in place that states that they're acting in the film and that the film company or you as the artist has the final ownership. So they're agreeing to participate in it and you've paid them and they, or if there isn't compensation, maybe they're getting some sort of profit share. That's very common. So if people are donating at a time, maybe they get, you know, 10% of any future revenues and that kind of stuff. But that's really important to put those contracts in place. The next area is things like a photo. If you're working with people in the photo, models, you need a model release agreement. So just because you took a picture of someone out there, you need to have their release. And sometimes for documentary aspects, for documentary photography, you know, if it's really, uh, you know, part of news and things, you might not necessarily have a release because it's part of something that's happening. It's of interest for the world or for the community but if you have a model and they're like you know you're posing or they're they're outside whatever it is or even if you're just taking pictures of people you can't just do that you need to have model release forms so even if you took a great picture you can say hey look i got this great picture uh you know of you sitting on this bench from behind i don't see your face but i'd love to get you to do a model release form and they might agree to it otherwise just consider you know working with people or having someone but you also still want to have some sort of sign off that's really, really key. So why is that all important? So, you know, that comes down to a chain of title. Then we're gonna go back to the copyright registration. So chain of title, what this establishes is the ownership of the final work. So this requires contracts and an overview of the authorship of the digital artwork. So that means who took the picture, who's in the picture, that kind of, that's what's called a chain of title. How did this work come to be? Did you write the song? Did you perform in the song? You hired the artist, the final song rights were contracted and you own it and the musicians were paid. That's a chain of title. Chain of title can then also include, like I mentioned before, a cover. So you're doing a cover. So someone else wrote the song and you're doing a cover of the song and you're using musicians or you're doing it all yourself and that's the chain of title. You've gotten the rights to do the cover or you're paying the, for the, the, the writer of the music and so on. The other thing, chain of title for films, it would involve 
having the contracts for the script. If there's a narrative script, so you've, you know, you've optioned or purchased the screenplay, you've hired the actors, you've hired crew, everybody's worked under contracts. And then the final film is with you as the filmmaker artist. And that would be a chain of title showing that you did all of that. If you're missing any of that, technically the copyright is then not really just with you, or the rights to that particular film, but it could be with everyone because you haven't done that. And that's okay if you're doing, you know, uh, yeah, student work, you're doing prototype work, just understand that you might not be able to then exploit it. And exploitation refers to being able to sell it or distribute it. So if you're just doing a project for learning purposes or exploratory purposes, that's fine. But if you want to put it out there, then you can get into all of these issues. The other thing with music is having the rights to music or the other thing with films is having the rights to music, I should say. So the music rights are important. Did you sign the rights to the publishing rights, which are the writer's rights and the master rights? So those are two aspects for film and you need to have those to include the music in your film. You can't just take music and put it in there. Now we're seeing that more and more with things like YouTube or people just use any kind of song, but then the song is listed in terms of what it is and then ads appear. So they're basically saying, hey, you've used this piece of song, you don't have the copyright cleared, and so we're gonna just let people know where they can purchase the song, where they can hear the song, and we're gonna put ads around it because it goes back to the artist to uh, profit from, to make some money. But if you, otherwise, your film, you should clear all the music and so on. If you're using any kind of stock, so this could be in your photography, in your uh, any kind of animation, film, even in music, you might use some stock sounds or effects. You want to make sure that you've purchased the entire rights for the stock elements. So, you know, what rights do you need? The stock could be just be limited rights. So you want to make sure that you have all these rights. Do you have the rights just for limited online use? Do you have the rights to put it uh, worldwide? So territorial rights and medium rights. So is it for online only? Is it for television? Is it for worldwide? Is it Canada only? Things like that. All of these aspects. So a lot of things to think about. So that comes down to that whole chain of title and the rights and making sure that you have all the rights. A really big, big topic, but you know, want to introduce this idea that you want to think about all the contracts you need. And again, this isn't legal advice. It's just giving you an overview of things you need to consider. The best thing is if you have something very complicated, there's a documentary, there's complex, potentially complex rights. So this could be story rights. It's about a person, but you don't know the person. I would highly advise you can seek out a lawyer or an entertainment uh, specialist lawyer and you can, you know, get some advice. You can set out some, uh, you know, how much budget do you have for the legal advice? Just consider that. You can make it, uh, you know, more of a, you, you need a, a consultation to just figure out. And then it might, they might give you very quick advice and then you'd be able to understand, hey, this is very complex. I shouldn't be doing a story about um, Michael Jackson because I don't have the rights to be able to do that kind of a story. So it's really great to have those kind of conversations. So I highly encourage that if your project is a little bit more complex. Um, and if it's very complex and you don't have a big budget, so try and find something again. You can, you know, you can tell your own life stories, your own family stories, things that are part of your sphere, your knowledge base and your life can be used instead. So now we get to the last thing, which is copyright registration. So once you've done all the chain of title work, you need to do copyright registration, and that establishes the ownership and date of creation for digital artworks. Oftentimes, the Canadian copyright law basically states that you know when you finish writing a script, when you finished a film and it's it's mastered, that that copyright is done. When the music is finally recorded, the copyright is established. When a photo photographer takes a photo, that photo is the photographer's copyright at that time. Now, again, those exceptions are, do they have a model release? Do you have actor releases? Do you have the musician releases and all that kind of stuff? Because it might be a shared copyright aspect. But a photo, let's say, of a flower, that was your copyright at that time. But if you think you're gonna be trying to exploit it commercially, like to sell it, you want prints of that specific flower, you wanna sell it, you know, you wanna do prints and offer a thousand prints and sell them for X amount of dollars, you should consider registering the copyright and that puts a date and your name as the author to that specific piece, a digital asset. So that could be, you know, a play, a film, music, animation, photography, anything that is an artwork you can put a copyright on. 
Also in things like uh, a film, we often see a copyright line. So you see the letter C with a circle and it says copyright, uh, you know, 20, uh, 2022, uh, you know, Tom Sternad as the author, right? So that tells people that I've, you know, this is copywritten uh, at that point. But the next step is to do the additional copyright registration. So you can go online and uh, Canada has the uh, innovations and uh, trade website and there's a direct copyright certificate that you can just register. It takes about 10 days. You pay a small fee and then your work is uh, registered in that manner if you want to have an actual certificate of copyright registration. So that's really everything that you need to know in terms of getting to your rights protection and digital assets. So, and then the next thing is we get into and, and you can access, go to tbmcs.ca. You can go back to our YouTube channel. We have a film mastering and distribution masterclass that is uh, four parts online and it's on our YouTube channel. And in there we talk about distribution. And that's the other thing with your rights protection is how do you distribute it? So if your music, let's say, is going to iTunes, you're getting, uh, you know, there's, there's a rights thing where you still have the rights, but the distributor, in this case iTunes, is selling the music, they keep a percentage, and then you get the rest. So that kind of percentage deals, that's the distribution side of things. So that could be the same thing with, let's say, a, photo a photographer with photos, putting them into a gallery. The gallery will usually have some sort of a commission or a percentage they might take on the sale. Just like music, iTunes will take a percentage. Film, same thing. A distributor might take 10%, 30% of a specific sale or a distribution. So let's say on Amazon or iTunes, again, they take a specific percentage of that sale or the rental, and then you get the rest as the artist or as the author. So that's a whole rights uh, 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 protection, and it becomes your intellectual property and then you're exploiting it. And that's really important as, as an artist, how do you start to exploit your art? How do you start to make, how do you monetize your art as well? Because, you know, that's the whole point. And digital arts really allows it to be easy, but at the same time, those rights can be, uh, you know, you wanna make sure you have everything in place and you wanna make sure you're uh, protecting those rights and making sure that you're not just putting it out there. So if you put a photo on, let's say Instagram, and you wanna make a print of it, be clear like on Instagram that, you know, this is just a part of the photo, maybe not put the whole photo up because people might just want to take the photo and then use it like that without buying it as a print. So just things to consider where you're posting things. And that's why you see things like little snippets, behind the scenes videos, trailers, things like that that aren't showing the whole piece, but just giving people an idea of what the film or, or photo might be about. So it's really an important aspect. So, you know, again, if you have any questions about data protection, archiving, and rights protection, feel free. You can just email me, tom at tbmcs.ca. I'd be happy to continue the conversation and uh, be able to do that. Uh, so, again, just send me that information. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's really the, the key uh, thing there is, you know, don't be afraid to ask uh, questions and, and get advice. And I, I'll do my best, and I can also just give advice and say, hey, you know what, you should really talk to a lawyer. Uh, and they can give you the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, legal advice in, in protecting this. But there's a lot of great scenarios. And a lot of these distributor systems and things have a very clear process. For example, Vimeo, they have a video on demand. Uh, they keep a percentage and then you take the rest. I believe it's about a uh, 30% uh, 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 cut on that. So, you know, really great tools out there that you can access. So, again, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, this has been the Data Protection, Archiving and Rights Protection. Creator Space online session for digital arts rights in a digital world. Once again, uh, my name is Tom Strad. I'm the lead artist, uh, lead digital artist of the Creator Space project. And uh, you know, want to thank everyone for joining us. And I want to thank all our partners in this project. So we have the Canada Council for the Arts, and then we have our library partners. We have the Blue Mountains Public Library, we have the Collingwood Public Library, and we have the Wasaga Beach Public Library. You can access digital arts computers, digital arts equipment, and all three of these libraries. And like I said, there's IMAX available and we already have some data protection and privacy software in place, so you can access those. Thanks again for joining us, and I will see you guys soon. All the best and take care.